recording as well. And I think we're ready to go. Here we got the slides up. Good morning, everybody. Um, this is <laughs> the, the 55th webinar that we've run it is. Uh, for the Copyright and Online Learning Special Interest Group. So I'm Chris Morrison. And I'm Jane Secker. Yeah. And uh, I'm, we're, well, we are the co-chairs of the Alt Special Interest Group for Copyright and Online Learning, as you said. Um, and we've been hosting these webinars now since March 2020 yeah, so, yeah. and we're very excited to be in our new basement studio which is why I've just temporarily took taken the slides down so that you can see us in all the glory and we'll come back to that in a moment yeah um, so let's crack on with what we're talking about today another excellent lineup we've got some um, really interesting bits of copyright news we've got some uh, well fantastic guests again special feature on the book navigating copyright for web uh, for uh, libraries yeah purpose and scope Finally, the, the, <laughs> the running order slide has, has turned up. Um, and then coming up next, so all within the hour, lots of excellent stuff to look forward to. Yes, yeah, and we're absolutely delighted. We're, we've got two of our guests joining mm. us from Aus Australia. Yeah. So it's quite late in the evening. We've got the book. Haven't and we, we have now? the book. Yeah. As you can see, that's just because it hasn't arrived for me. Somebody has respect. a print copy of it. I do. Some I'm very a, fortunate person. Must be just <laughs> something about, mm. I don't know. If you ask for something to be sent to the Bodleian Libraries, maybe that's what the, the, the thing was. Anyway, right. Um, Special th privileges. Since we last met, we've mentioned the fact that we're in a different location. Yes, yes. So yes. that is what we can see when we're looking at you guys. Um, <laughs> it's not complicated. There aren't enough trailing wires. I no, think, yeah. definitely not. I think we need not. it to be no. more complicated. And we need some really hot studio lights, mm, yeah, so yeah, I yeah. start sweating a lot. I think that's that'd be great. Cool. Yeah, um, yeah. And we haven't got people with a cat either because she's sulking upstairs. Is she? Yeah, yes. Right. She'll probably turn up at some point. Yes, yes, yes. But that is her earlier on when she was just testing things out to see how it felt to sit on the sofa mm -hmm. and join you all this morning. So, thank yeah. you, Wendy. Um, right. So, uh, this is a reminder that there is a, an archive of all the webinar recordings um, on our blog, but also on the Alt YouTube channel. There is a uh, special playlist. I shall pop those in the chat right now. Webinar. So right previous on. ones and we've had um, uh, a whole range of excellent speakers. I'm sure many of you are aware of them and we have very pleased to have returning guests uh, as well. So we're on to this next item. Okay, copyright news. Copyright news. Um, we've got a couple of items today, haven't we? We've got, we've got a few here. So uh, the first one is that uh, I think we knew this was coming, but um, this is uh, confirmation that the extension uh, of the copyright term, the, the length that copyright lasts in Canada, has increased from 50 years to 70 years after the death of the Should author. Should we say boo at that point? I, well, I tell you, I think this is something we're probably going to return to yes. as part of the main conversation. So, yes. um, I'm not sure we do need to turn it into a pantomime at this oh, point. Okay. We could probably have a more nuanced conversation in a moment. But, okay, uh, okay, yes. Uh, but yes, a, a, a major event. Absolutely, yes. Copyright news. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the next um, item was um, that there has been a series of essays published, um, uh, pulled together by Paul Keller and Alec Tarkovsky, um, called The Paradox of Open. Mm -hmm. um, I started reading um, one of those um, last night, that's the one that's all about um, copyright and the copyright wars. Um, and um, it's kind of got some, what are the unintended consequences of open, um, what, are the, what are the things, you know, that, that Open was trying to do that perhaps it's, it's where mm. it's not succeed. So it's quite a critique, isn't it, really, on this idea of open access, open education, open everything. Really, really interesting um, piece, which I'm looking forward to reading more about. I can't say too much more because I haven't read that much of it yet. But yeah, I picked it up earlier in the week and mm. we were discussing it yesterday. Thought it was worth flagging up to people. Yeah. Something to have a look at. Mm -hmm. um, so the next item is this uh, webinar on open education resources happening on the 7th of December um, and 
Yes, yeah, the Eden Network, yeah. Yeah. Um, which is a European uh, funded network um, for people who work um, in, I think, primarily in sort of distance education, online learning. Um, but they've got an interesting session. We're seeing um, an increased interest again in open educational resources. Um, and this is a, a webinar about institutional approaches to supporting uh, OER, which is something we're both very interested in. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. Like uh, having session. some very interesting conversations with my colleagues um, um, at the Bodleian at Oxford, so I'm definitely going to be tuning into that and seeing what we can, if there's anything we can learn from it. Absolutely, which yeah. Absolutely, there will be. Uh, we have the next one, which is a seminar on fair use uh, by a friend of um, yeah, so this the is webinar and Isla, yes, um, yes. Tom, Tom, Tom Lipinski. Um, he's actually giving an in-person lecture um, at the University of Cape Town um, in South Africa, but it's a hybrid event, um, and so um, you are able to to sign up to join um, on the 13th of um, December. Just need to check your timings for that. So they've advertised it with the. Um, the timing in South Africa, I think, are they a little bit ahead of us, a bit behind us? Anyway, people can people can get their world time. It's like a straight down, isn't it? It's not a cross. No, yeah, no, no. So it's, it's similar this time, though. Similar. It is similar. Yeah. So that's 13th of December, and it's going to be looking. Um, at, uh, he's called it fair use or fair use. Fair use. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Looks like an interesting discussion. Absolutely. Mm. Um, Jessica said ahead. Um, but we can, yeah. Other people can work it out. They have access <laughs> to um, freely available information source, I believe, yes. to work out exact timings depending on where they are. Yes. Um, so we are, I think, on to our main event, aren't we? We are. Which yes. is again focusing on this book, the uh, Navigating Copyright for Libraries, which we picked up on uh, some time back because we have a chapter in it. We have chapter thirteen. We do. Um, but we're also uh, really pleased to have other authors within the book coming and joining us and talking about um, their chapters and get a picture of how this all meshes together um, and, and how this stuff works in practice. Mm. Yes, and we are really delighted to to actually have one of the editors of the book, Jessica Coates, um, our, our friend who's at the National Library of Australia, uh, where she's the senior rights advisor who's going to be um, joining us um and uh we'll we'll hear a bit about how the book came about from jessica um also really pleased um to uh, have uh, professor tom cochran um who's from queensland university of technology um who's going to be joining us um to talk a bit about um his chapter and ongoing interest in in copyright and copyright reform and um another another Good friend of ours, Stephen Weiber, who is um, the director for policy and advocacy at IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations. And obviously, the book um, is an IFLA publication. Um, Stephen wrote one of the chapters, particularly looking at WIPO um, and um, the work that WIPO has done to to lobby and advocate for the rights of libraries um, it, when it comes to copyright. So, really looking forward to hearing. Um, from our very esteemed guests, and we're very delighted that they can join us. So welcome, welcome one and all. I'll stop sharing the slides so we can see you. Yes, and uh, I think we're going to go to Jessica first, um, if if that's okay. So hi, Jessica. We've done a bit of a sound check. We know you. We can hear you, and uh, it would it would be great if you could um, just maybe just say a bit. Chris is waving the book I'm around at the, the moment. Around. He's waving the book at you. Time. So can you tell us a little bit um, about how um, the book came to be? Maybe, you know, how you came to sure. recruit all the authors and the process that you used and the fact, obviously, it's an open access book. Yeah, essentially, the book was conceived of, I think, all the way back in about 2019. So, uh, or even as early as 2018, but basically by Tom Lipinski, who you mentioned only a few moments ago, um, not just <laughs> by him, um, but uh, the Copyright and Legal Matters Committee um, of the of IFLA. Um, essentially, uh, Tom was one of the main members. He was the person who took it on to start off with, but that group decided that it really was important as part of the series, 
publication series that IFLA has been putting together to have one focused on copyright. It's obviously such a major issue for libraries and archives and everybody. Um, and the committee, you know, had a lot of really some top world experts on it. And so they really felt that they could source this and it would be a useful tool. Um, so it, the conversation started and some planning about how it should be structured, etc., all started. And we we kicked in, transferred some the editors a little bit. Uh, and at about, we were just ready to hit. About the end of 2019, we were all ready to go and start <laughs> working on this book. <laughs> um, so uh, basically, it all luckily it was all happening online anyway, um, and it was mm -hmm. a global. It was deliberately global, and uh, you know that a lot of effort was put into sourcing authors from every continent. Uh, yeah. Any, every inhabited content, continent, um, but um, as much as we could. Uh, so we just kept going through, but it did mean that uh, I think that having COVID and the lockdowns did make the process much harder. I'm really still in absolute awe of all the authors who were able to continue to produce chap the chapters um, and all that kind of thing. We as editors were meeting uh, every few months and then every few weeks at different points and all that kind of thing. And you would get to hear uh, how hard it was for people in all different parts of the world. So uh, I yeah. still we are so grateful for everybody that they were able to achieve this in such a hard time for so many people. Um, but they did. Uh, so essentially the where the authors were sourced from was contacts with the CLM committee and uh, you know the library copyright community um, is pretty connected around the world. Uh, there, a lot of effort I said was as I said was put into sourcing people from different parts of the world but also both uh, legal practitioners, um, people like me and others who are lawyers working in the field, but also librarians. It was really important to us that we did have, um, you know, practitioners and uh, and academics. So people of all uh, with different perspectives on the copyright and um, libraries as um, thing. So uh, eventually we end up with 20 chapters, which is just amazing that we managed to get quite so much. Um, covering uh, everything from the basics of copyright, um, which me and uh, Tom wrote um, on primarily, um, all the way through to some of the hottest topics, uh, you know, the latest issues. And that was one of the best things, having a lot of the academics who, and people like yourself, sorry, I should point out, both of you are, of course, authors <laughs> as well, um, who were really in the forefront uh, and doing research in the area. Um, so it was really great to have uh, such a broad range of people in the book. Um, but as you said, uh, right from the very start, one of the biggest focus and prim probably the prime uh, goal that we had for the book was for it to be open access. Um, yeah. Uh, that was, uh, it comes, it's a natural outflow really of um, the Copyright and Legal Matters Committee. Uh, you know, half of the committee are open access advocates. Um, you know, several of us have worked for Creative Commons or we work for, you know, open science organisations and things like that. And of course, librarians, are, you know, the whole point of having uh, libraries is to try to um, share knowledge. Um, so it was it seemed like a very natural fit for it to be uh, a trial um, for IFLA's first op um, immediately open access publication. And it was really great that IFLA was really supportive of that. They were able to provide funding to help support the openness and um, and negotiate with De Groyters. And De Groyters was very supportive as well. Um, they mm. used it as a test case as well because they're going to have to start being more and more open as it goes on. Um, yeah. Uh, and as well as the open access, we were also very, very focused on ensuring um, that it was also accessible um, in terms of disability access. Um, so um, that it comes out in DAISY and all the other forms. Not all of them are available yet, but they are in place. Right. And it's very yeah. much a thing because, of course, in the same vein, a bunch of the people in the book and in the room uh, worked on Marrakesh Treaty. And so, um, you know, yeah. it just seemed logical that we would have to have it open right from the start. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting, isn't it, Jess, I think, to see, you know, how many libraries might decide to actually purchase the book in hard copy because mm. they want it um, on their shelves, <laughs> how many how many downloads. So, as you say, for De Gruyter, a really interesting, um, mm. you know, experience mm. of, of publishing yeah. an open access book yeah i was going to, I was going to ask is is there any sign is it too early to tell what the impact is of publishing it as open access but also the print because that's a, a common a common point of debate mm. isn't it in the whole open access area 
if I make it open access, no one will buy, no it. One will buy it. And it's mm -hmm. getting rid of the idea of the book. I mean, I have to say, actually hold it. I'm going to keep doing this. Actually holding it in yeah. my hand makes it a different experience. <laughs> there we go. Um, and reading through the, because, you know, before I arrived, I was reading through things mm -hmm. as a PDF on a screen, but it's quite a different experience, isn't mm -hmm. it? So in terms of numbers, do you know where you are with this or is it too early to say? I don't yet. I don't know if Stephen knows anything um, from inside IFLI headquarters, um, but we haven't heard anything about the numbers just yet. It, it, it is fairly recent. It was only released in August. So, and uh, yeah. I think that was a formal release. So um, fingers crossed. I, I have a fair amount of faith that actually it won't affect sales much um, and that it will certainly help with, uh, you know, spreading the information. I've already, mm. we, we've already heard about um, plans for translations of chapters and things like that. So uh, it's really, that's the whole point. It's just getting that information out there. Yeah, it's <laughs> fantastic. And, and are there any plans, the, the options for turning it into a feature film? I'm thinking about what the FA uh, We are talking, is to no. <laughs> <laughs> talking to Spielberg. No. We're talking to Disney. No, we're not talking to Disney. No, no, no. Oh, <laughs> uh, but you never, you never know. I think no. the options are always there. No, no, no. Um, Thanks, Jess. So I, I wanted to, to ask Tom about uh, if we start at the, you know, the, of the three chapters that you've all written. Um, Tom's yours is a, uh, a historical account, the foundations of copyright, um, and takes us through uh, and excellently uh, summarised in in just 14 pages. We have uh, several hundred years of history um, from the Renaissance period up to the Enlightenment. Um, and I think that's just, it's a really good primer because so much as we know, those of us that are into history, so much of what happened then informs where we are now and it mm. explains why we have certain uh, conceptual philosophical underpinnings of, of the system that we have. Mm. Um, and one of the things that you, you, you refer to is the sort of traditional Anglophone history of copyright. So that focus of the statute of Anne as the first copyright law, but you, you pick up some things around other areas of new other ideas that were uh, also around at the time that copyright was developing. So can you talk us through some of that? <clears throat> yes, yes, sure. Thank you. Um, like a lot of us, um, the way I got involved in copyright in the first place was by engaging in issues of our time, and particularly the rise of challenges that came with the, with the digital age and the way that some behaviours of some organisations started to change and the need for libraries and kindred organisations to find a way of responding to that. When I came actually to, when I got the, the request to, to consider doing the chapter, I eventually found it to be an entirely absorbing project because the amount of thought that I became aware of that went into the original, the drafting of the original mm -hmm. statute was very deep. and. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that was also good to be reminded of is that the statute involved the nomination of libraries with a role in um, the keeping and, and, and holding of knowledge right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So it's not something that came along later, it's provided for in the Statute of Anne in 1709. Uh, so the, the, the chapter um, just rehearses the issue of why it appears to be an Anglophone orientation. Um, the actual first, the first steps that arose as a response to the arrival of printing were actually Venetian, um, in Renaissance Italy, that's not surprising. But the notion of protection was really about the protection of know-how. It was almost like a a precursor to a blend of patent and copyright uh, and wasn't a concept of the author as such. But mm. then neither was it as, as it developed over the next 200 years in Tudor and Stuart England. So that mm. was really about the role of the stationer companies in, uh, in a relationship they had with the Crown, which, uh, which had outcomes for both. For the Crown, it was the ability to um to enroll this private this private group in the control of information but essentially in censorship and in turn uh, the station has got economic protection for, for their work and all of that evolved and just going over what what's mostly in the chapter there chris mm -hmm. but all of that evolved into a, a period which all was also uh, where there's quite a bit of change of thinking 
And that also corresponds with civil turmoil in England. It's the mid 17th mm. century. The Star Chamber is abolished in 1644. Um, and it had had a role in, in uh, some of the, the enforcement. And then you have this, uh, the, this uh, particular contribution by John Milton, uh, Ero Pagetica, which is about it, which is about the importance of authorship. And so by the late by the late seventeenth century, you have an evolution of thinking to the point where copyright becomes more a concept of property and less a concept of censorship, which of course then goes into another form of regulation uh, as time goes by. So um, the chapter really describes the the main characteristics of of that 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 system as it develops. Um, and and then the other interesting thing about looking at it was that the significant legal case I mean, the station has held on after the after the statute they they kept um seeking to assert former privilege and didn't finally give up until the the, the case in 1774 um and and it's really interesting to think that that's only two years before the the american rebellion mm. And as we all know, um, you can't read about copyright without reading what the founding fathers of the US Constitution thought about it. And so <laughs> there's this kind of continuity of British. Looking around, uh, yes, there were developments in France, especially in the 1780s and 90s. Um, there, was, there was a lot of, um, unsurprisingly, radical thinking. But really, it's the statute of Anne that kind of enshrines this thinking of a balance between authorship and the notion of a public good. And so that was mm. the other thing, of course, is that the notion of a public good develops, but is certainly absent at the beginning of what you of, of the period of the evolution of of copyright. Uh, and one other one. Sorry. Carry on. Yeah, one one final thing about the chapter is it 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 became interesting also to consider the arguments proposed by Pamela Samuelson in some of her work about which is just briefly described towards the end of the chapter under the heading back to the future which is that if you look at what the statute of Anne provided right back at the beginning at this basic beginning we've seen a steady move away from that in various ways over the next 300 years um, so that um, there are certain similarities between what concerned commentators, especially from the library and kindred organisation point of view, have to have to say about copyright now, and some of the trends that the statute was was more or less addressing, with a view to developing balance, and uh, and that that set of of characteristics. Um, is really interesting to review because although, although it might sound odd, um, a lot of the current desire for reform would simply be no more than establish the intent of the original statute. It's, I mean, it's a fascinating process. The thing that I'm, at the moment I'm reading The Dawn of Everything by, um, uh, uh, Baber and Wengrove, which is the, the account of the sort of prehistory of, of human civilization and actually looking at that again and saying those stories that we have come to accept and about the way that the Enlightenment came along and the Enlightenment thinkers introduced all these different uh, concepts is actually um, an incorrect uh, statement of, of what was happening. And, I, it, and, and even though the parallels aren't necessarily exactly um, aligned, I think there's a sense in a historical context that we are so sophisticated now. We've got all these sophisticated things. We've worked it out. And everybody throughout history was mistaken because they were ignorant, because they don't know what we know now. Um, whereas actually what happens throughout history is people actually think very deeply. And mm. there's a very uh, uh, you know, rich process of discussion and debate about how things work and that if you actually look into prehistory it's not just that they were they were they were dunces that didn't know anything about computers they were thinking about the underpinning conceptual things around 
how you would want a law to regulate creativity and production of it and, and, and consumption of it. Yeah. Um, and we can learn a great deal from that. Yes, yeah. I mean, it's worth remembering that the changes associated with the statute included the notion that the state no longer had a regulatory role in publication, but also that the right to acquire copyright could, could be um, exercised by all persons. So, and, and also, of course, there were limitations on the duration and so on, 14 years, renewal mm. once and it had to be registered and, and those, those things. But of course, in that clause, the availability of um, copyright being acquired lay the future for publishers. Mm. Because, of course, that's how it works. So it, it probably didn't take too long for some of the stationers, which you know really is a, is a word that's almost uh, interchangeable with publishers by this time, mm. to figure figure out, you know, the authors still want dissemination and control of dissemination is with the control of the technology. Mm. So absolutely. Um, yeah, it comes across really clearly, I think, the, yeah. the, the impact that technologies always had on on copyright right from the yes. outset but i was also yeah. i was really interested tom in the the part in the chapter where you pick up i think it was in some of the german states where they didn't actually have any um regulation they didn't have any copyright and it, it kind of publishing flourished didn't it i think and it's quite an interesting well, well, so, that's the theory yes i haven't yeah i haven't seen that rigorously tested but yes it was an interesting argument to come across that in 19th century germany mm. part of the advancement of science was the greater availability of it yeah in published form yeah, mm. yeah. very interesting so if we if we look to where we are now because so uh, just your chapter um then picks up so you're handing off the baton from where tom's taken us all the way up to the enlightenment and then we're now in the period of of the modern age and mass communication technology and then copyright just goes and then expands and fills all the gaps. Do you want to talk us through that process? Uh, yes, well, my chapter uh, was probably a bit, I feel like it was both less ambitious and more ambitious than Tom's. It was uh, mm -hmm. less intellectually ambitious uh, uh, in that the basic, I, right from the start when it was being planned by the CLM group, we all thought it was very important that uh, it also be an educational tool, like the that the book mm. could be useful as, to learn about copyright. And so we had intended that there to always be kind of an early chapter that would just be the basics of copyright. And that's what yeah. I set out, a copyright primer. That's what I set out to produce, a copyright primer that would just basically lay out how it works as much as you can mm -hmm. on a global basis um, with from the perspective of libraries and with a little bit of, uh, you know, a little bit of angling towards the things that really uh, libraries value and that you hear a lot about a lot in copyright world and uh, at library conferences and things like that, but maybe not in other parts of the copyright world. So importance of public domain and exceptions and things like that. That's what I set out to do. And uh, not nearly as intellectually um, uh, yeah, ambitious as Tom's, but of course, in practice, it did turn out to be very <laughs> ambitious. And, uh, you know, what we were really aiming for was a nice light, you know, 5,000 word primer. And what we ended up with a 10,000 word kind of um, tome, because once you want to really try to cover, ensure that you're, you're capturing civil law a bit, a bit. I don't, I'm not nearly as big an expert on civil law, so I feel a little bit bad that it might have been neglected. But civil law as well as the common law and um, making sure that you do cover at, at least touch on important issues like why do we have exceptions and what is their role um though there yeah. are whole other chapters that also deal with that um yeah it just uh, became and and the importance of things like human rights um that was picked up by one of the really? reviewers um the peer reviewers um that i hadn't really built that in and that's very important in large parts of the world like latin america in the formation of copyright um so we you know had to include that uh, yes so it's so i'm not sure it is the light uh, you know, easy primer that I had always intended it to be. Um, well, I, I think uh, it's, it's certainly it was inevitable. a good place to start if you want to find out about copyright. <laughs> I, w I would say that it's it's. I think there's there's only so light that I think you can make copyright uh, yes. <laughs> if you wanted to actually have any use in any substance. And I think what you've done with your chapter is 
you've got it as a historical narrative so it does pick mm. up that so it's kind of easy to follow from that perspective it is also stating the facts about how copyright law works but because it's not just doing it in bullet point list because it's got that yeah. narrative structure but but also because it does have some kind of conceptual frameworks where you're not just presenting the law as it is but saying well certain laws fit into these sorts of categories yeah. so i mean i think it's it's a real achievement that you've put it all together and i think it really is that excellent primer of kind of where we are now and how we got here from the dawn of yeah. copyright law itself absolutely it's the other yeah. thing is really important because some people coming to the book were of course already going to be massive experts in this field but other people were not and uh, in order to understand a bunch of the later chapters you do really need the kind of foundations that tom and my chapter both put together um, uh, to help you understand why some of these issues are complicated and why people are debating them and um that kind of thing so we, yeah we did think it was very important to at least have it there um, yeah. I am quite keen on the idea, and I think CLM has genuinely talked about this, about editing it. It is open access after all. Everybody else should feel free to as well. <laughs> to try to create a lighter version, like, you know, just try to pull out the higher one. Especially, you know, once you've written something once, it's always much easier to make it shorter the second time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think Perhaps if there was a... Graphic novel version. Tom, yes, do you want yeah. to come in? Yeah. Uh, I think if there was a basic, if there's a basic message, you know, from beginning as you mm -hmm. fly through, it is that um once the principles are established all of the argument and tension has been where the balance should be so yes the the yes yeah, so the principle of a public good you know the advancement of learning to use um, mm. the language of the time on the one side and due recognition to the author on, on the other was mm. all it was and what happens mm. is the author actually gradually um, turns into the publisher more and more until that's mm. an enormous industry. And then that compounded with the arrival of new technologies. The other interesting thing about this is it's a, it's an error to think that we live in, you know, in our lifetimes in the age of the rapid arrival of new technologies. They actually um, arrived with great speed in the second half of the 19th century. Yeah. Mm. And that's what and and that's what started to attract uh, a lot of attention yeah. so and that then had the effect of moving the balance as well that's definitely been one of my, was definitely one of my messages all the way through that in in many way all like most copyright reform for centuries has been a response to um technology and the reason mm -hmm. why the last 20 years has been so hard is because of there's been such technological change like it's it, it is it's a real challenge to people from both sides and libraries really do that balance is so crucial uh to the concept of copyright to me balance is uh really the core principle of copyright and libraries sit at that point of balance like they yes we exactly. both as tom said we we're very very keen on sharing knowledge that's you know always been really a very strong focus of me but uh we're also very very keen on books and authors <laughs> we want the industry to continue yes. yeah I, I, look, I, I, yeah, and I, I think the point on technology when I, when you think about it is, yes, lots of change arrived in the late 19th century, but what's different about now is mm. how many millions of hands technological capability sits in. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, this seems like a really good point, though, with you you talking about you know the the role of libraries. I think we should bring Stephen in, um, who wrote his chapter um looking also looking specifically at, at, at wipo the world intellectual property organization looking at um the the advocacy work um that's been done at, at wipo um and um you've you've actually been there stephen haven't you as well so you've attended uh the 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 committee meetings related to copyright um what's it actually like um, going into WIPO, Stephen, being the voice, the, the champion for libraries. Oh, wow. Um, I, so <laughs> just say apologies right now. For some reason, it seems that my video keeps on getting turned off. So my, my computer obviously isn't playing ball with the screen. So I apologize. Oh, we we'll see a, you a moment a ago. less exciting oh. visual experience than it might have been, especially <laughs> because I've got exciting curtains going on behind me. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, um, it probably loses its magic quite a lot. I, I think... Um, I think what one of the interesting things you see at WIPO is, is, is that 
and, and no, th th there's two aspects to the WIPO work which I think you know, make it interesting or, or mean that it, it provides a certain sort of angle on how we do copyright. I think part of it is the fact that the nature of the place, you have relatively short meetings. It's rare to, to say that a meeting that lasts a week is short, but um, compared to an ongoing legislative process that involves consultations and rounds of meetings and so on, a, a week is a short period of time, a two or three minute intervention is a short period of time. And so you tend to get quite a sort of condensed way of looking at things. And, and I think that sometimes this can lead it to be a little bit of a punch and duty show where people <laughs> sort of stick to their high level principle and, and it, it, it turns into sort of Thomas Aquinas and 13th century theology about at how we should see copyright and, and how we should interpret it one way or the other. Um, that's not to say that it isn't a place where things can't get done. And the Marrakesh Treaty is a fantastic example of when the setting and I think in particular when the cost of inaction becomes greater than the cost of action actually things really start moving and I think it, it, it's aided in some ways and which brings me on to the second point it's aided in some ways by the nature of the place and, and that's contradictory because it is to some extent like any intellectual property office or intellectual property organization it is at risk of capture that, that that's just a, a fact if you are focused on just like an agricultural ministry will tend to be extremely well connected with farmers or, or with farmers or a business ministry will be extremely well connected with business logically an ip office an ip organization will be extremely well connected with rights holders which brings its own sort of world view with it um and so there is a sense that i know we have ip in the title it, it feels contradictory. It can feel odd to be sort of questioning IP and suggesting that maybe IP should have limits because does that mean that we should have limits also? At the same time, what's really interesting in Geneva is that a lot of the people who are there are dealing with other parts of the UN system. And so their day job is to look across the development agenda. And they're also dealing with aid, they're dealing with health, they're dealing with education, they're dealing with the way the internet works. They're dealing with a lot of these broader questions and that actually can open up some interesting angles because you actually have people coming along there who by their nature and, and professionally they are supposed to see things in context and it, it sort of comes back to these sort of questions about you know, what is ip for but it, it allows you to like yeah. sort of blow things open because in the end these are people who are seeing ip as being one tool in the toolkit and it's a question for them, well, is this the tool that actually allows us to achieve the goal or not? And in what way do we use the tool in order to achieve the goal? So it means you get some interesting discussions. You get this full on IP purists that more IP must be good because it's in our name. But you also get a lot of people there who actually are development people and they're thinking not how can we get more IP, but more how can we make IP work for us and work to actually uh to help us achieve our goals so and it's it, it's all to say it's complicated it's a mix of complicated and oversimplified but you get a really interesting mm. insight and it is a place where things can get done mm. Mm. It's, i mean it's a fascinating insight because i think those of us looking at that legislative process and the international advocacy more from from the outside uh i i get your you, you mentioned marrakesh a great success but otherwise it seemed like it's there's there's a certain amount of stalemate um we talk about the broadcast treaty that's been going for decades and not really got anywhere and and then you know how i guess how easy is it for actually libraries to get their voice heard i know that the the standing committee on copyright and related rights was only relatively recently set up and only relatively recently libraries really able to input into that um so it sounds like it is a place where even though we don't you know, it can be quite frustrating. You're saying there is a place where we can get some successes. So I, I think a key thing, and this is something that, that comes out in the chat to it, is that there are different things that can get done when you're there. I know, for, for, first of all, um, obviously legal instruments are lovely. And it is absolutely the case that if WIPO comes up with a treaty or something like that, then that provides a 
it, it, it provides a trigger, it provides a stimulus for governments to do things in a way that, I don't know, tragically enough, copyright is not everyone's number one priority. Um, <laughs> if, if you are a small government with limited capacity, you're maybe not going to make copyright the thing you deal with first of all. And so actually mm. having a, a, a trigger from above, from on high, in order to actually look at it is helpful. Um, Clearly, also, WIFO is the only organisation that can actually provide a sensible, science sensible solution for looking across borders. But there are other things that we do that you can do there. I think we've seen some really interesting work, and especially I can see that um, Ross is on the call here. Um, the Arcadia Fund has been supporting some work led by the American University in Washington to increase engagement. And actually, one of the really interesting things that we've seen about that is actually this and working through WIPO has opened up just to go and talk directly with national policy makers and use the proximity, use the lack of barriers that a place like WIPO offers. You don't have to go through five layers of secretaries and under secretaries and over secretaries and sideways secretaries and whatever in order to reach the decision maker. You can just go and talk to them immediately, hook up, get an, I don't know, get an agreement, get, 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 get a session, a, a meeting in the diary and actually start reaching out through there. So there's an opportunity to use a place like WIPO also to shape the way that people think, to seed ideas, to get people sort of reflecting. And obviously that's not got the same, you know, it's not got the same sort of immediacy and more obvious causality that a treaty has with change, but it, it opens doors. It makes things possible that may not otherwise be easily done. I, I see uh, one thing I've, picked up, sorry, just to, just to come to say that one of the th things that I think the library sector gets kind of fobbed off with, isn't it, by not having the legislation, by having these kind of model or soft law and these sort of frameworks, which are sort of the watered down thing that allows us not to get what we want. But it sounds like there is the value, not necessarily that, you know, those are preferable clearly to having those other triggers, but that there is a value in, in, in getting some of those conversations happening. And Jessica, can we go, I'll go to you on that. Well, that, that, that's actually, I was about to say, it's a perfect point, segue to saying that, honestly, advocacy was a not-so-secret goal of the book right from the start. Like, uh, I mean, I think you two build this into your work as well, but, uh, but CLM was very clear right from the start that we wanted the book to help people understand copyright uh, and librarians understand copyright and, and what's going on at the moment, but also to be able to advocate in the space. And you really, people need a basic understanding of the law, but they also need to hear what other people have, what other, like, what is, what are the arguments in favour of the importance of exceptions? Um, yeah. ha what is happening at WIPO? I mean, I think Stephen's chapter is a fairly extreme example because most um, librarians, most um, of the most of the people reading the book won't be at WIPO. Um, but by hearing what debate's going on and by hearing, you know, sort of the arguments being being put forward um, by some of the top thinkers in the world, um, and case studies such as there's a whole chapter um, talking about the experience of South Africa, which is so close to being a success story. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're still hoping that it will be a success story. It's um, just on a knife edge um, in terms of reform. Um, but, uh, yeah, the, the book was deliberately designed to include this advocacy element and to encourage librarians and anybody else in the space to really think about how, you know, they can change their own local laws to better themselves and their, you know, community. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think, Stephen, coming back to you, you, you mentioned Ross is on the call today. You mentioned Arcadia and clearly if they're heavily involved in the Knowledge Rights 21 project to increase capacity throughout Europe. Um, so presumably this work, your chapter of the book, is a kind of integral uh, part of that project as well. Uh, 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 absolutely. And I think I think this feeds me now bouncing off of, of Jessica's point there. And it's certainly it's a support we're really grateful for because it opens up possibilities to try and, I think maybe combat some of the, what we were saying right at the beginning about, well, you have to get through, there's a minimum number of pages of reading you need to get through before you get involved in copyright advocacy. I don't know, it, it shouldn't be necessarily like swimming badges. Um, I think <laughs> what, what we need to do is we need to, we need to work in the direction of giving people the skills, the confidence, 
not just to see copyright as something that's been handed down from above, that, that's sort of written on stone and brought down from Mount Sinai into the desert, but as something that is is malleable, that is, is something that we can actually go out and change, and that not only can we do it because I know, we're voters and we're stakeholders who have a legitimate thing to say because you know, we are doing something that is a, a public value activity, but also because actually we, we should do it because right now we are being held back, we are being restricted mm. by laws that haven't kept up with kept up with the times. And if we believe in the value of access to education, research, culture, if we believe in the value of access to information, we need to be trying to change not just through our own practice, but we need to be changing what other people are doing in order to yeah. facilitate this. And, and helps in that direction by providing a reference, providing a source, and, and we're really looking to build on that in order to actually turn understanding into agency. Yeah, I think, I mean, one of the, the threads I, I picked up running through your three chapters is also this idea that kind of came about um, that I know um, Professor Ronan Deasley was always very critical of this idea that copyright was a, a human right. And, you know, it's, it, you know, I know it, it's it, it's kind of when you it's about balance, isn't it? It's about it's about that balance in that the right of that the author to, oh, we can see you, Stephen, with um, the right to access to information, you know, which surely is a more fundamental human right. I, I think also some of what you're hinting at, Stephen, and I know we talked about this um, a little bit um, at the Ice Pops conference in September in Oxford, but it's this sort of notion of, of what Chris and I, and I think you're starting to call critical copyright literacy and, and whether, you know, the book's playing a role in in kind of really you know as you say encouraging people to to start to question copyright more rather than just saying i've got to learn about it and how it works i, I i've got some agency haven't i yeah look one of the characteristics of um, people coming whose, whose working lives have to grapple with copyright in the way that librarians do is that it seems bewilderingly arcane and, yes, and and people are, tend to take a risk-averse approach to thinking about solutions to access issues. So anything that can be done to encourage people away from that risk aversity and to and to even see copyright and and advice on it as being a, a risk management process where you, where you apply some of some reasonable judgment to you know depending on the jurisdiction you're working in to the advice that can be given to people about how to improve their how to improve access generally mm -hmm. mm. i mean so so a work like this this book so it kind of explains how the, the um the convoluted developments have have come into play uh, over a long period but at the back of it still is this is this notion is when you strip it all away, it's not really that complicated. It's about this balance between um, the right of creators, etc., and and access, and being and being wise to the fact that as as in all periods of of history, those who have the ability to uh, to gain economically through influencing legal instruments and developing new forms of rights will do that, and. Yeah. That need and that that challenge needs to be met by those who are trying, who are keeping an eye on the main game, which is how society is, in total, is to is to move forward in a reasonable way. Mm. Absolutely, and I think just going back to your chapter, Tom, that as you said um, when you sort of talking us through it, that the fact that libraries were so heavily involved have always been heavily involved in this discussion, um, and in fact predate the history of copyright um, means that it's absolutely essential that they're, they're in the mix. And I think that this book and the way it lay, lays out the issues allows us to continue that work to sort of situate it and, and, and try to influence that mm -hmm. balance in the right way. Mm. And because they've always been about access, they necessarily have agency. Mm. Yeah. And to remind people that this is a space that the libraries really have always been in, 
uh, and that we do have a role and you know we should be proud of the role that we have and we should not be afraid to push for change when we need to in the modern debates often any argument in favor of open access is dismissed as being you know sort of linked to giant multinational corporations and benefit bail gain uh, and it's very easy to forget that libraries were always there we were always there and we always will be and we as librarians should be proud of that Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, I think we're, we're, we're kind of coming to the to the end of our time. So what I wanted to do is ask each of you in turn about whether you're hopeful for the future. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've we've we show, see that there are challenges. Um, we've seen, for example, in our news, we've got the, the Canadian copyright term extension, which against all evidence, this shows that it's uh, overwhelmingly a problem to have longer and stronger copyright in that way, but that's the way things move. The challenge there is of getting the library voice in there. I guess kind of other newer, sexier topics like AI and copyright come up, but we've still actually got the fundamental basic things around access to, to information. Um, so, I mean, uh, uh, let's, I'll start with Tom. Tom, are you, are you hopeful for the future of where we are in our, in the profession of uh, whether we can advocate and, uh, or, or, or are we merely on the precipice of quite a dangerous uh, period? Uh, I think I'd say I have a cautious and, and sort of moderated optimism, but I mean, the, the good things that have happened, I think have, have included, um, the estab establishment of more thoughtful and skilled advocacy and, and organisational interrelationships, which are really about trying to defend and promote access. Um, against that is this pattern of governments. I'm thinking here of the Australian government, but I'm sure this is an, this uh, uh, is more widespread. Have a tendency to be presented with a complex problem send it off for review to a panel of experts and, it, and with extraordinary expertise, get some answers back and then fall victim to very heavy lobbying by interest groups that yeah. have got a lot, of, a, a lot of sway and a lot of money and then decide it's too hard to go ahead with legislation and then do the whole thing again 10 years later. And that, that yeah. is a very, that's a depressing cycle. It's not just confined to copyright law reform. In Australia, it's particularly true also of tax law reform, but um, I think we, we're, we're familiar with that. And so there's an issue about how healthy government is mm. in terms of act of doing what's right than ra rather than swaying with the greatest influences and lobbyists of the, of the moment. Mm. Yeah, we saw this at the CREATE conference um, a month or so ago where they were looking at evidence-based copyright policy making mm. and the evidence you know shows lots and lots of things but you know it's a very interesting to... debate is it even worth trying to do empirical evidence on copyright given that everyone ignores it when they go through that process yeah yeah what what, what about um stephen what what's your what, are you hopeful for the future stephen you're always a positive person can we get that well, camera back on I, I, I can try but normally the camera will give you sort of I mean, imagine some good grinning confused face you know, this may last for a few seconds are. and there we go okay, okay it's gone um, and he's gone again <laughs> so, no, okay but balance sort of economisty type answer that you know, there's things for both sides so for example okay canada not great news but arguably that was because they wanted to sell beef and lumber um in order to be able to take part so okay, we, we sold copyright for beef uh, well, Canada <laughs> sold copyright for beef or whatever. Um, at the same time, Mickey Mouse is in the public domain and the Disney Corporation didn't try and extend copyright even further. So th there's, mm. there's positives and negatives in that one. I, I think we are beginning to understand that copyright really is one side of the same coin as library funding and that there's growing mm. awareness of what's going on and that people are looking at that. I, I, think, it, I, don't know, I think maybe in order to succeed, we might need to start thinking about being a little bit more hard nosed as it's pretty clear that those arguing against copyright reform are working to the same playbook every time it's a very sort of i don't know claim that you represent authors claim it will be the end of the world exploit the fact that you have access to communications channels to do things threaten legal action claim it's unconstitutional there's a pretty standard playbook that gets followed in these situations and, and 
we've seen that it backfires. In Germany, the sort of slightly hysterical full page adverts that were taken out by some rights holders really backfired. They annoyed the government no end. So sometimes mm. the rights holders will just go too far. They'll just, you know, Thomas Keneally swearing was probably a great argument for copyright reform because it just underlined the sort of lack of rationality on the other side of the debate. I think the one thing I'm slightly scared of is that there's such a risk of copyright being privatized by shifting across to licensing. And I think that's yeah. something we do need to look at because actually almost debates about the shape of copyright law itself risk becoming entirely moot if everything can just be overtaken by licenses. And so that's something we really pay attention mm. to. And without looking like we are, we'd like to go back to only paper and reject licenses as a concept. We do need to be able to act, engage in that debate and make sure that people aren't forgetting that, well, unless you bear in mind licenses and services, then I think this is sterile. Mm. Jessica, one minute for you. Are you hopeful? <laughs> well, the good news is I am a natural optimist, so maybe a nice one to finish on. Um, I do <laughs> think we, we've, I do agree with Stephen about the privatisation. That's concerning. But I do also mm. think that in the 20 years or so that I've been in the field, uh, you've seen we've seen a lot of progress. And if you just think about your average people and common sense that people, uh, you know, common sense, how much more comfortable people are with access and how much people assume access. So whether it's in you know museums who 20 years ago were saying we can't possibly let the teenagers near our treasured items uh, but now have great websites um you know and putting everything in the public domain up online uh or mm. you're talking about um you know your average kids who uh you know just can't conceive of not being able to make use of video clips in when they're communicating with each other and stuff like that i do think that the world Ha and, and and the open access movement groups like creative commons and stuff the world has is moving to back to really appreciating access to knowledge a lot more and i think that's a really good movement so i think if that keeps happening uh then it's inevitable that copyright will slowly move the thing is it doesn't move fast but luckily as again in the library sector we have a lot of patience we don't move fast yes. ourselves, so <laughs> we can just keep hanging on and um and hope and we should be able to see the changes that we need thank you what, a great, what yeah. a great note to end on um thank you so much all three of you for coming and joining us it, it really is a privilege to be uh would to be asked to contribute to the book but also to have you talk um for it it's just been really great yeah really and i think congratulations it's time for jessica and uh, tom definitely to have a, a glass of something fizzy yeah. given the no, time cup of being... cocoa yeah <laughs> yes, that's yeah. The one. <laughs> um, uh, but thank you so much for joining us we uh we really do appreciate it and um we we yeah we're well we'll be in touch i think and and yeah continue to share well, the publication of this book and you know your fantastic work so thank you and and i'm well, just going to jump in and to not only share it but to remix it and share it around and remember you yeah, can download every idea. chapter for free right now anybody who wants Absolutely. to read anything just grab it now and do things with let's it have, let's have a hackathon a festival of yes. creative reuse absolutely absolutely <laughs> yeah We've just got a, a minute or so, less than that. So just future webinars. Um, we have been putting together a schedule for our 2023 webinars. Yeah. And um, we've got some dates lined up. We're just lining up speakers as well. Um, but we do hope you'll join us in two weeks time for our Christmas festive fun. It's, yeah. it, it may have a small theme related to copyright, but I think it's gonna be much more on the fun side, mm -hmm. isn't it, Chris? <laughs> we'll see. Um, it's going to be good. Yes, yes. absolutely. Yes, um, um, but we are going to return to the topic of um, the navigating copyright book um, as a special treat for uh, the day before my birthday. Actually, yeah, okay. then uh, you permitted me to read. I think from our chapter, <laughs> haven't you? Excerpts from our chapter. I don't think that that's not quite the format. So we are <laughs> we're working out the details, but the plan is to get somebody else to interview us about our chapter. But I think we will be able to reflect on that in the context of this fascinating conversation and what we were saying and how it how it 
absolutely how all those things come together absolutely and um, uh, so all those deep speakers tbc we've got a few names people saying that they will talk we definitely are going to talk about the cla license requirements that the sector yes, needs. use will. this format for getting everybody to input into it yeah um, so we'll we'll be in touch with more information about that with our cnac hats on we will yes um, excellent so, so again thank you so much um and i know this is now the time isn't it for everyone to leave one last thing uh, should I play, play the one last thing? Oh, yeah, jingle? play it. Okay. It's Christmas. It's we, need, Christmas. we need a little bit oh, of that. Well, next time, here's the one last thing jingle. It does go on a bit. It does a bit, doesn't it? Yes. It's probably why everyone leaves. I think so, yes. So well, where good our comes to listen, and you know you have to go. You only set aside enough for this, but there's one more gift we like to do a fade out. Okay, so that is what the, the one last thing is that we've been watching the playlist on, that's, on, that's on Netflix. The, yeah. the, the, the fictionalized for, account for copyright nerds. Yeah, if you if you want something on Netflix that's got lots of discussion about the copyright wars, this is the one for you. However yeah. accurate it may or may not be. Yes, it's a bit like the crown, isn't it? it, it yes. Um, yes, it does actually go into the future as well. You haven't got to the end. I haven't so got to. No, the end. no, no, no. So, so it's quite, I, and I tell you what happened because because of my background in music licensing when I watched it, it i suddenly found myself it flashed back to the the uh you know the, the mid 2000s and going oh it you was were traumatized, <laughs> weren't you? You were traumatized slightly traumatized right? and yes. the, the the part where they go into stim and they have that conversation with the the you know the licensing person i mean it wasn't quite like that but it wasn't entirely that unlike was your life. that, that was, was your my life, life. Having people just go, I'm going to change the world. There's a new streaming platform. We're going to make everything. We're going to make money. Though, Chris. Otherwise, you wouldn't be sitting I, in this basement with me. So, okay, no. so thank you so much. I yes. think we could stop.